you've used the word actionable yeah. and that that's a favorite word of mine but Great. it's a favorite word in my in my research group um i love doing science i'm fascinated by science i've been fascinated by science since you know since i was five years old but i think scientists have a an ethical responsibility to make sure that their science makes a difference in the world. And, and that's no, nowhere is that more true than environmental science. Dr. Stuart Pym is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Stuart is a professor of conservation ecology at Duke University, is one of the world's most highly cited and influential environmental scientists. He's an internationally recognized global leader in the study of biodiversity, especially present day extinctions and what the world can do to prevent them. The media turns to him when they want to know what's happening in our planet and on our planet. He is adept at explaining a complex issue in a reliable and relatable way. His message that we can all make a difference in our planet's survival inspires a wide range of audiences. Pim was awarded the 2019 International Cosmos Prize, widely viewed as one of the most prestigious honors presented in the environmental field. We will touch upon that in our discussion as well today. The honor recognizes Stewart's groundbreaking research on endangered species, as well as his work through his nonprofit organization, Saving Nature, to promote practical approaches to help slow or reverse species declines by protecting and restoring their shrinking habitats. Past recipients of the Cosmos Prize include Jane Goodall, E.O. Wilson, Richard Dawkins, and Sir David Attenborough, a fine list of other environmentalists and activists, scientists around the world. Among other luminaries in his field of conservation science and natural history, his international honors also include the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement in 2010 and Dr. A.H. Heineken Prize for Environmental Sciences from the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2006. Pim's commitment to the interface between science and policy has led to his regular testimony to both the House and Senate committees of the US Congress. He frequently visits Washington DC to engage policymakers on environmental issues. He is also asked to advise international governments on biodiversity issues and the management of national parks. Stewart has served on National Geographic's Committee for Research and Exploration and currently works with their Big Cats Initiative, an effort to reduce human wildlife conflict in Africa, Asia, and elsewhere. He's a lecturer on National Geographic expeditions. In addition to his conservation efforts in Africa, Pim has worked in the wet forests of Colombia, Ecuador, and Brazil for decades and this is a long-term, and he is the long-term collaborator on the forest fragmentation pro project in the Brazilian Amazon. In the last decade, he has been active in training Chinese conservation professionals and spends a month each year in China. Stuart directs Saving Nature, savingnature.com, a uh, 501c3 nonprofit that uses donations for carbon emission offsets to fund conservation groups in countries to restore their degraded lands and areas of exceptional tropical biodiversity. Their science board is composed of some of the world's most eminent and accomplished conservation biologists. Now I could go on and on, but I want you to know that that not only is he active in science and biology, and he has written well over 300 scientific papers, five books, including the highly acclaimed assessment of the human impact of the planet, the world according to Pym, a scientific audit uh, audits the earth. His students have gone on to important positions into top universities worldwide, 
others directing science at International Union for Conservation of Nature, the World Bank and Monterey Bay Aquariums, US governmental agencies and international NGOs. So as you know, as you can see, I welcome my guest, Stuart Pym. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Pym. And I hope you don't mind me calling you Stuart. I, you know, we're, we're both up there in years and we have uh, done a lot of accomplishments. You uh, a thousand times more than me and have been around the block and seen our world in many different ways, but I'm sure there's many things that I've left out in your list of, of accomplishments. It is truly unbelievable. Um, we came together and first uh, uh, got to this point because of a paper um, study uh, ecology and economics for pandemic prevention investments to prevent tropical deforestation to limit wildlife trade and and I want to talk about that as well as um, other things today on the show but first of all welcome and thank you so much for taking your valuable time to be here well, thank you so much for having me on the program. Yes, please call me Stuart. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. This is a wonderful opportunity to talk to you, and um, I greatly appreciate you giving me that chance. Thank you. I, I mean, it's, it's exciting. So your list of accomplishments is just innumerable, and uh, the thing that really touches me the most is, is it's really actionable science uh, that you do. You really, not only you have a, a deep passion and, and, and very learned wisdom through, through your experience, but you, you want to see, not, let's not just report about it, let's not just talk about it, let's get out there and do some actionable items that will make it different and change the situation that we're in. And that's really what has drawn me in all your works. Um, uh, to, to this discussion that, that I want to let my listeners and viewers know about, about what some of these things are. So now we, we went well, through... To run to a second. Go you've ahead. Used, you've, used, you've used the word actionable. Yeah. And that, that's a favorite word of mine. Uh, right. It's a favorite word in my, in my research group. Um, I love doing science. I'm fascinated by science. I've been fascinated by science since, you know, since I was five years old. But I think scientists have a, an ethical responsibility to make sure that their science makes a difference in the world. And, and that's no, nowhere is that more true than environmental science. Um, and I had a a sort of a conversion when I was in my late twenties. Uh, my science was being widely recognized. I was working in Hawaii. I was working on species that were going extinct. And I thought, what would the world think of me, um, you know, 40 years later, um, if all I'd done was great science, but I hadn't made a difference. So actionable science is absolutely what, what my group and I are committed to doing. That's fabulous, and thank you for for that insight. Uh, I all all the scientists, all the um, researchers, and those who are in, involved in conservation and, and environmentalists, uh, the ones that I see as my mentors or heroes, uh, and I, and you definitely fall into that category. Seem to also take that approach. This very actionable: how can it be applied in in your biography? I mentioned. Uh, Jean Goodall is also a recipient of the same prize that you you have, and she's very, uh, very active participant in, in all that she does. To, still to today, she is very active. You know, 200 plus events a year, and and very outspoken in what she does uh, among I, the I've, others. I've had the the the, uh, the great privilege to to do a couple of congressional briefings in the United States with uh, Dame Jean Goodall. Um, she is an amazingly tough act to follow. Uh, but the last time we had dinner together, I, I sort of said, you know, uh, how, Jane, you know, how, how much time do you spend at home? Um, and, you know, she's this very slight um, um, a lady. Uh, I mean, she's older than I am, um, but she has such an amazing spark 
and and she, and you know she said something like two weeks yeah. um that's you know the rest of the time she she's out there trying to make the world a better place she is a huge inspiration um I, i've uh, i've had the when the first time i uh i was on, at a congressional hearing with her i got to the hearing oh probably about an hour before it was due and there was about a thousand young women and their mums that you know trying to get in to see to see her and i i almost had to you know fight my way through this crowd of uh, of young women who wanted to uh, wanted to see her yeah, it's a great great privilege to 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 have a, a shared uh, the same price as she has yes it, it it is and i believe you're also uh, have, have many um traits that are similar so she makes time for for people on a one-on-one -on -one basis. She wants to hear their stories. She wants to shake their hands. And yes, today we're in this age of selfies, but she wants to not only hear their message, but to depart her messages to them. And, and I see that in, in, in your wit work as well. There, there's a little bit of, uh, of, of a gap. And also for those of my listeners that, that uh, haven't heard of you before, um, I would, was hoping you could kind of fill us in. So you um, have been doing this work for a long time, which I, and I don't want to make an assumption, but for me, it would say that you have not only by doing the work, you know how to turn it into actionable um, things that will help species and, and our environment to, to be more resilient, but that also requires a certain amount of resilience for you and the way, may, way you think, kind of thinking resiliently, critically thinking, thinking in com complexity sciences and, and, and the things that you do, has that at all helped prepare you for this pandemic time? So you've probably lived a, long enough to see other pandemics or other great things or bad things that have happened on, on our world, but has any of that helped you to weather this pandemic a little bit better and give you insights of what we're doing right or wrong to get to get through this time. And maybe uh, that's where we touch on the paper that we're going to talk about soon. Um, what not only preparedness, but preventative measures can we take to make sure that the next one's pandemics aren't, aren't, aren't as worse or we make them through them a lot better? You, you've asked two questions. Yes. One about pandemic, which I'll answer second. The first about, uh, uh, about sort of background and origins. Um, I, I like to say that like Lord Elrond in Lord of the Rings, I was there at the beginning. Um, and I literally was there one Thursday afternoon at the University of Michigan, about 35 years, 40 years ago, when a group of us voted into existence uh, the Professional Society, the Society for Conservation Biology. Um, and the reality is that the science of um, conserving biodiversity is, is a very, very new one. Um, and I've been rewarded um, very, uh, very kindly, as you mentioned early, earlier, because I brought science into the business of conservation. So yes, some of the stuff that I do is, is, is technical science. Actually, quite a lot of it is technical science. But I think the important thing is that it's science that makes a difference. Um, and I firmly believe that what science does is to give, to give us an edge. It gives us insights into what we can do to be uh, to, to, you know, to be more efficient, what we can do to prevent species from going extinct. And that explanation um, segues very nicely into the question about, uh, about the current pandemic. Because what we know from, from science is that a couple of viruses a year spill over from animal hosts um, into the human population. Um, this is an epidemic that we anticipated. There are scientific papers predicting that this sort of thing would happen. There were papers that anticipated what would be needed to prevent it. So, I mean, within, you know, within my teaching career, 
Um, I've seen a couple of influenzas that have killed a million people or more. Uh, that have come into us via, via, via pigs or chickens, domestic animals. Um, but I've also seen, um, you know, more than 10 million people around the world die of, uh, of HIV, of AIDS. Um, and that came into the human, human population uh, because people who were clearing forests in Western Central Africa were, were killing chimpanzees for bush meat. Uh, they were butchering those animals and they became infected with, the, uh, with their blood. Um, and what we're seeing now is just one of a string of pandemics that broadly we've got because of, of, of a couple of things. We're, we're moving into uh, tropical forests, rainforests, if you like. Um, and we're coming into close quarters with species that harbor diseases there. Um, and we're trading in, in, in animals. We're eating animals, wild animals. Uh, you know, COVID-19 came from bats. Um, it, it may have come via pangolins, but whatever, we are, we are bringing wild animals into close contact with others. Um, and in doing so, we have caused tens of trillions of dollars of damages, you know, and, and you know, pushing a million, uh, a, million, a million casualties. So I think, you know, there's a lot of science out there and it's, it's incumbent upon us as scientists, us as ecologists, to look at what those causes are uh, and to address them. Um, and uh, with uh, Andy Dobson, a close friend from Princeton University, we assembled a, a stellar team of, uh, of, of, of men and women scientists from around the world, from China, from South America, economists, uh, environmentalists, epidemiologists, to answer the question, you know, what could we do and how much will it cost? The bottom, uh, uh, you know, the bottom line of that message is it's going to cost a lot less to prevent the next, um, next pandemic than it will cost if we don't. I, I, will, I will have Andy on, the, on another podcast, hopefully here in, in a couple of weeks. So we'll also get in, into depth. I wanted to uh, really, because you're so knowledgeable, you've been doing this for a long time. It, it would have been nice to, to have you both, but I think it would have been unfair to have uh, a, 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 a show with both of you on it because you each have so much that we could go down tons of rabbit holes. There are so many things with environmentalism, conservation, and, and, and this that you each offer. So I've decided to split it up into two different shows. Um, I, I, you know, you're, you're a tropical conservation biologist, I guess, as, as, if I'm correct, uh, as really the, the specialist. And um, you, you know, you mentioned you've, you've dealt with this in, uh, over many years in different factors, you know, HIV and, and these things. Have any of those experiences helped you personally weather the pandemic better, but also say, wow, we, we actually had preventative measures or, or um, uh, things in place or that we discussed about uh, to avoid this happening years ago. And this is just as very similar to SARS, MERS, HIV, or other facts. We did, we're still not listening and we're Every time there's a new pandemic, it's like we're recreating the wheel or we're not using any of the learnings from the past, implementing them uh, immediately to, to be more preventative, to make sure that when this occurs in the future, that there's not only humanity has more resilience, but that we get through it. I mean, there will be some, but that we get through it a much different way, less cost, but also less human suffering, less environmental suffering. Uh, uh, to get through it on. So I'd like to know a little bit more of your, your thoughts or feelings on how that's helped you, but also, you know, what, what are you seeing? And, and did that lead to writing this paper or, or um, 
kind of I want to kind of get into your brain what 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 the process was in that see if we can get any learnings for for our listeners out there that give us well, more insight. One of the lessons that's immediate for me um, is is that I'm teaching students at Duke University um, who are in various stages of lockdown. Um, the university is still open, so we have some students on campus. And as I've been telling them, I have the experience of teaching students at the University of Pretoria in South Africa, where I've had, uh, I have the wonderful title of extraordinary professor there. Um, and I first went to South Africa after and Nelson Mandela became president. I boycotted South Africa during the apartheid years. And so over the last 25 years or so, I've taught classes where I know that a fraction of the students that I teach uh, were going to die from, from, from AIDS within five years. When I started teaching in South Africa, um, uh, uh, young adults of between the ages of 20 and 30 were dying at a faster rate than, uh, than people above 60 or 70 years old. And what we learn from that is that it's not just the average behavior of, of, of young people that was at, at issue. It was the behavior of a um, of, of very, very highly risk um, taking individuals. Um, in the case of HIV, people are having lots and lots of unprotected sexual contacts. And the issue that many of us are facing now, many universities are facing now, many countries are facing now, both in, uh, uh, um, certainly in Britain, and, and from what I understand in Europe too, but definitely in the United States, is that while many people are, are prudent and sensible in what they do, there's a fraction of people who are Take, taking very, very risky actions. And we have to, we have to take care of, of these extreme behaviors if we're gonna get the pandemic under control. So for me, that's an immediate lesson that comes from, from having looked at a, a, at a previous epidemic. But let me sort of wind it back right to the very beginning. Um, and that is that a lot of these diseases come from from the tropical moist forests of the world, or certainly the tropical forests of the world. Um, and they come from these places because these were, these are the last places where we humans have, have spread. That as our, as our world population has grown, we're moving into, into areas that previously we left unoccupied. You know, when the, the Spanish flu epidemic a um, hundred years ago spread through the world, there was only one billion people. Now there's close to seven. And with that increasing human population, we are moving into to, to rainforests, into dry areas, and we're pushing the boundaries of nature back. And we're coming into into contact with, with diseases that um, we, we didn't encounter before. I mean, the story of HIV coming from people killing chimpanzees in Western Central Africa is a very obvious example of that. Um, and that raises the question of, do we need to do that? And, and, and the, sort of the tragic answer is no. Um, it, it's not that we need to destroy the world's rainforests to feed people. Um, the interesting case of Brazil, which has the world's uh, biggest rainforest, the Amazon, is when under a previous administration, they decided to cut back um, deforestation and cut it back to about 10% of what it had been historically. Um, their um, yields of soybean, which is the principal crop, went up. And it went up because they decided to invest some money on better farming practices rather than just sort of willy-nilly clearing, um, clearing the forests. If we look at Africa, Africa's population is growing faster than anywhere else. 
And a lot of that is causing uh, people from, uh, from the south to move north into the dry forests that fringe the Sahara. People are moving from the north um, into, into these areas too. There is a collision of two peoples, of, of Muslims from the north, Christians from the south. And so there is a zone of, of conflict that stretches 6,000 kilometers east to west, sea to shining sea, you know, Dakar to Mogadishu, um, that comes from desperately poor people moving into, into lands that are really unsuitable. You know, I could go on, but we're moving into, into places that do not make us rich, do not feed us. Um, and the costs of stopping that um, are quite modest. The second part of the story is that there is a huge wildlife trade. Some of it is wildlife for meat. Some of it is wildlife for exotic pets. When it comes to meat, that, uh, that, those wildlife markets in China, that, 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 that my, our Chinese colleagues tell us, are worth about $20 billion a year. Um, and for, I have lots of Chinese friends and colleagues, and there's no question that the Chinese realize that that, that $20 billion is, some, is a market that needs to go. It's cost China many, many times more than that uh, in losses of, of life and, and economic activity. Now, it's not always as simple as that. There are cultures around the world um, that depend on, depend on meat, there are, you know, where if across 60 million square kilometers of the planet, people can't grow crops, they graze animals. But nonetheless, there are clearly some low hanging fruit. There are clearly some activities which, which nations could um, either um, close down or, or find alternatives or, or the simple and prudent alternative is to make sure they have more vets who can go in and check that animals in, in captivity, where being bred in captivity, are healthy. So, you know, prevention is a lot, uh, is a lot cheaper an option than, than cure. We don't yet have a cure for, uh, for COVID. We know that, you know, hundreds of thousands of people more are going to die until we do. Um, Bill Gates just came out and said uh, as well that uh, COVID is going to run its course by 2021. I've heard other specialists, uh, um, scientists, and, and doctors say that they're that it's going to it's going to be around for about two years, and then it's going to run its course, and then something else will come in, and and whether we get the vaccine or not, which is looking fairly positive, that. Um, just like MERS, SARS, and the others, is going the big majority will run its course, and then um, there will be the next thing on the radar. Hopefully not, but I wanted to see what your views are on that as well. Is, is it kind of a seasonal thing? Is it only something that lasts that long, or do we still not know enough about it? Um, I, I think the, 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 the best answer is we don't know enough about it yet. Um, if you look at, um, at diseases, um, a disease doesn't want to kill you. A, a disease wants to reproduce and, and infect more people. And if it kills you, it's not going to uh, infect as many people as it could. Uh, unfortunately, that simple evolutionary scenario is complicated by the fact that to be able to spread um, you know, COVID needs to make you cough and sneeze and, and all the rest of it. And it's precisely by clogging up your lungs full of uh, gunk um, that it infects other individuals. So it, it's not clear what the, uh, what the evolutionary pathway of COVID is going to be. There, there's no really compelling evidence yet that it is becoming more benign. Some diseases do become more benign, but not all of them. So that's an open question. Okay. Um, rather easier to answer is that you can calculate what fraction of the population need to, need to be immune. 
either because they have caught the disease and recovered or that they've been given the vaccination. Um, and that has to do with this number that we're all hearing about called the R value. It's the reproductive rate. In other words, if you know, if you're infected, how many other people are you going to infect? Yeah. Um, and, and the World Health Organization thinks for COVID, that's about 2.5. And that means that we would have to, um, we would have to make sure that 80% of the, of the population had either caught COVID and recovered um, or, or had been given a vaccination. And I think um, when we look at the United States, it's not clear uh, that enough people would, um, would become immunized, even if a vaccine were available, uh, because of the general hostility to, to science, vaccination, all the rest of it. Um, it varies from country to country. Um, you know, I saw a, I saw a report on, on, on the Netherlands, um, and as you might expect, you know, everybody in the Netherlands got the memo, and you know, essentially everybody in the Netherlands would become vaccinated. Um, but, but the Netherlands is not the United States. Um, so I, I think the worry is that even in countries where, where people could afford to have the immunization, it's not clear that that's, that's going to take place. And if that happens, then indeed this disease is going to hang around and, um, and there are going to be periodic outbreaks, just as happened in, in, in New Zealand, which went 100 days without an outbreak and, then, and then, there was a, then there was an outbreak. So I'm afraid it's going to be with us for a long time and it's going to alter our, um, it's going to alter our social behavior in much the same way that HIV altered people's social behavior. Um, you know, I can't imagine that anybody is going to want to go to, uh, you know, to very dense concentrations of people indoors. But once again, if we look at what's happening on university campuses uh, and indeed elsewhere, there's always some young men and women who feel that they are immortal and so they can, you know, spend the evening with a hundred of their closest friends in very close proximity. I think there's a lot of things like that that are, are still um, going to be very difficult to assess, but I think it's going to be around for a while. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to a vaccine as soon as possible so uh, I can get on with my life, but I'm, I think it's going to be a while. Yeah. Well, we don't want to get on with life as a uh, business as usual. I believe we, sh we should get a big, the great reset that we should definitely think of more preventative and prevention uh, methods for the future that kind of let us live more resilient. There are some things that you said earlier that I wanted to just touch upon. For first of all, you know, you're, you're a professor at Duke. You've got uh, also um, the, the great title for the uh, Africa, South Africa University as well. But you are an educator of all people. So all students, uh, you know, whether that's businesses, governments, or whoever. So we're very fortunate that uh, you think well beyond those universities that you're affiliated with, that you're educating us all. So that's humbling. You mentioned that you were there in the beginning uh, um, uh, of that conservation. Can you tell us the date, 1970 sometime, or what, when was it? Early 1980s. I, it was either 83 or 85, I can't remember. 1983 or 5. So that was, that was actually um, uh, almost 10 years or, or 8 or 9 years after the real big environmental movement, Environmental Protection Act, Clean Air Act, but then finally this conservation. So started moving. I, I wanted to know that because it's important, you know, after we, the, the space race and, and we got to the moon and then we got the first and second catalog image of our earth and we saw the world in, in, in a different light. That was also really the beginning of a lot of environmental movements and, and awareness yeah. on our planet. That, that wasn't the beginning of the environmental movement, I mean, for certain. There, there were many, many influential people uh, who were talking about the environment well before that. Okay. Um, 
I think it does provide a very convenient marker uh, for the beginning of, of conservation science. Um, and we were hugely fortunate is the man who, um, who, who instigated that effort who died a few weeks ago, Michael Soleil. Um, Michael realized that it needed to be uh, it needed to be a very big tent. He, he realized that it needed to bring a lot of people together. So he had philosophers, he had theologians, he had social scientists, he had economists, um, he had you know, ecologists, he had geneticists. Um, and you know, I think that, that reflects in the, the paper that my colleagues and I have just, uh, have just published. And that is, you know, to tackle this, to tackle this problem, we need a lot of different insights. We knew we needed epidemiologists and ecologists. We knew we needed economists. Uh, we know we needed social scientists. Um, and we needed people from a lot of different backgrounds. Um, I mean, the fundamental problem is that we are not looking after nature well. Um, as we've grown from uh, in this central the last hundred years, from a billion people to seven billion people, we have been abusing Mother Nature. Um, and we've been saying for a long time that you know, Mother, Nature, Mother Nature is not a lady with whom you want to mess. Yeah. Um, and she's bitten back. Um, now, that means that we need to be more thoughtful about what we're going to do. But those sort of actions are, are complicated. They're, they're multifaceted. Um, there are surprising differences between uh, between people uh, across quite short, you know, short distances. Um, I'm always impressed when I'm um, on the uh, up in northeast India um, in the um, in the floodplain of the Brahmaputra River in, in in winter. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands of of geese and ducks and cranes in the people's fields and the people are wandering through these cranes, um, you know, and, and, and the animals there don't care because they know the people will leave them alone. Uh, 300 kilometers away in Southwest China, uh, people are shooting every, uh, every bird bigger than a sparrow, even though it's illegal to do so, because it's a, it's a different religion, it's a different culture. It's not to say all the Chinese are like that, far from it, um, but but different uh, different cultures have have very different um, different perspectives, uh, it, even within the same religion. Um, a few years ago, the Pope came out with a remarkable document called Laudato Si, which has a very very powerful chapter on on biodiversity and talks about what human actions are doing to that. Um, it's cyclical, yes, it's fabulous. It's cyclical. Document. Yeah. It's, it's sign. I mean, uh, I'm not qualified to talk about yeah. its theology, but I'm qualified to talk about its science. Its science is very, very good, um, um, and yet, and yet there are uh, there are um, varieties of Christians, subspecies of Christians, if you will, within the United States who feel that you know global warming is a myth, species extinction is invented. Uh, that we have uh, quite literally a God-given right to uh, to go and, and destroy the environment. So, you know, I, I've gone on at length about that, but clearly there are these kind of ethical and religious discussions which are very important um, and, and, require, and require dialogue, require investigation and require talk. So going back to Michael Soleil and, and being there at the beginning, Michael understood that. So he understood that we had to bring in, we had to bring in a lot of people to, to talk about these issues. That's, that's so important. And, and I, I'm gonna, I know we could get down some rabbit holes. We're, we're not even to the first real question yet, but I really want to get into it and, and, and uh, pull some things out because there's so many connections that can be made here. So the Cosmos Prize, was that tied at all to Carl Sagan Cosmos or is that a different, yeah. totally different organization, uh, uh, the way the prize was structured and named? Um, it, the Cosmos Prize takes its name from the flower, 
There's a cosmos flower. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm not sh sure, but I think it was pr the prize was established before Carl Sagan's uh, very famous, very wonderful Cosmos program on television. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I could be wrong on that, but it certainly, it wasn't, it was Carl Sagan and then, then yeah. this. It was um, the Cosmos um, flower, so. It was the Cosmos flower of the, from which they took the inspiration. I just wanted to make that sure because I didn't know and, and I, I wanted to know a little bit more about that because if it was, there are some interesting ties there as well. The, and the reason I wanted to find that out first is because my real question is about your, uh, your science, your thoughts and your feelings around biome, earth biome destruction and uh, our human health biome and how that interplays with viruses and diseases that we're seeing. We have a lot of um, ties to the earth birth, you know, where really basically started with bacteria, primordial soup type of things to present day, as well as all the bacteria, microbes and viruses and things that live in our body. Um, and then the biome, the, the earth biome and, and uh, how that microorganism world and, and uh, works as well. Is there some, some ties with your work and, and explanations that you can give us that also correlate or relate with that in any way? Um, I, I can't talk much about that because it's outside my area of expertise. Okay. To the extent that I understand that, um, it, it does appear that people who uh, you know, spend time in nature and, and, and you know, are, are sensible about, uh, about their diets, often have a much more diverse um, gut biome um, than, than people who, you know, who don't get exposed to nature and live off processed foods. Um, and there are developing um, studies that, that show that, you know, the, 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 you know, a healthy gut flora uh, a healthy gut, you know, microbi microbiota uh, lead to, to more health generally. But that's that's outside my um, okay. uh, outside my view. The the Cosmos Prize. I was hugely honoured to get that. It's about the uh, the harmonious coexistence of, of of nature and humankind. Uh, now I didn't invent that. They invented it when the prize was established. Um, close to 50 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, and I think that's a fantastic vision um, because it says, you know, we need to live in, in harmony with nature. And there's a sort of or else. Uh, and, you know, COVID comes along and says what the or else is. Um, so I think this is a recognition that, that, you know, as we begin to become a more, even more populous planet than we are now, we simply cannot take nature for granted. We do have to live, uh, we have to find practical ways of living in, in harmony with nature. One of my um, big, uh, she's passed away now, but she was a, a, a big mentor and uh, someone that, that I really admire her works and I, I wanted to see how, mu how much uh, you knew about her as well. But uh, there's um, some ties here to, to not only our earth and this, the, the cosmos and, and, and their vision of this, uh, I, I would call it a symbiotic earth or symbiosis of nature and, and uh, humans and species and, you know, connected to nature. Um, Lynn Margulis, you know, she came up with a symbiotic or symbiosis. She is uh, uh, really rocked the boat and um, started a scientific revolution. She was also a uh, American evolutionary biologist as well. I don't know how much you know about her, but she is also Carl Sagan's first wife. Uh, her second, uh, his second wife was Ann Durian. I just in interviewed uh, uh, his daughter, Carl Sagan's daughter, Sasha Sagan. But um, really the evolution of cells, um, a lot of work with James Lovelock, also from the United Kingdom. And um, 
she received the National Medal of Science, but she and many others since have really kind of said, we need to live in, in harmony with nature, you know, kind of have this uh, uh, symbiosis of, of our world on how we interact and, and, and see our connection uh, with the planet. Um, the, the other thing that's really unique is there's another Professor Chin who I saw last year in Songdo, Korea, uh, spoke at a UN conference where a lot of indigenous people were there. It's called the National Adaptation Expo in, in Songdo, Korea that was a host every year. And he said, humans need to evolve, homo sapiens really need to evolve into some form of homo symbiose. You know, and, and it's a new twist, it's unique, it's far out there, but it's more along this line, cosmos, this connection with nature and how uh, we're all tied together. I, I want to know, I, I read out of your work and or out of what you've done, that is also a very similar message. Um, Lynn Margulis was not only the, the evolution of cells, but it was this microrhizia and uh, 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 mitochondria and, and many other things that were there. And she actually totally went against uh, uh, Dawkins and, and other scientists as the single female at the time that says, you know, uh, neo-Darwinism and neoliberalism, that is absolute bullshit. Uh, it, there is no natural selection, survival of the fittest, only the strong survive. It's about collaboration and cooperation and more the symbiotic or so I would love to hear your thoughts and feelings on how that ties to your work and if you're in alignment anyway or or what we can how we can understand that if if you don't mind well um it, it's beginning to stray from from what I can talk about i I, okay. I never met him. Uh, uh, James Lovelock uh, my wife and I visited him and his wife um, you know he's a fellow Brit she's a fellow American like my wife um and and that was a wonderful experience. I love spending a couple of days with Jim. He's an amazing intellect. Um, and and you know he got into a he got into a dispute with Richard Dawkins, and I didn't think that did um, uh, uh, did either of them any good. But I, I do admire a lot of what Jim said. Um, in many ways, um, I'm a much more I'm a much more sort of mud on boots practical person. I think those ideas are important. I think they speak to the general topic of the fact that we do have to live um, harmoniously with nature. Um, but I, we have to figure out exactly what that means in a practical way. Uh, and those practical ways, uh, which are at the heart of the, the paper that we just published are, you know, not destroying habitats willy-nilly, um, not destroying species willy-nilly, not trading, you know, animals for their parts because we think that they may have some, you know, magical properties. Um, and most of my efforts are devoted through my nonprofit, Saving Nature, to, to the very practical side of, of restoring nature, of healing nature. Um, not only have we destroyed so much of the planet, um, what we have left behind is in tatters, in pieces, in fragments. So we have lots of little isolated patches of, uh, of, of nature, you know, and if you have a forest fragment over here and it has two tigers and they're males and a forest fragment over here and they have two tigers and females, you do not need a PhD in biology to know you're not getting any baby tigers. So what we do at Saving Nature is to work with local groups of groups that, that work with local communities, benefit local communities, um, are run by people in the local communities to, to restore nature. I mean, so to the extent that we have a metaphor, it's CPR for Earth, connect, protect, restore. Um, and I think we can, we can make practical um, actions. So um, yes, um, you know, I, I think J Jim, Jim Lovelock is a wonderful guy. Yes, of course, I've read Lynn's work. Um, um, but, you, but you know, when it comes down to it, um, so much of it comes down in the final analysis to planting a tree. I think the thing that gives me the greatest fun, you know, is, uh, you know, is, is, is 
digging a hole and putting a tree in it. Um, now, I don't do that very often, but the partners that we work with are planting hundreds of thousands of trees. I think the important message is that there are so many things we can do. We can do as individuals, we can do as citizens through the ballot box and through engaging our, our politicians. And there are so many things that we can do to make the world a better place. And I think if there's a single lesson from, from COVID-19 is that we have to do that. You know, that we can't just assume that we can forget nature and continue to exploit it. We, we have to get down and start doing some very practical things. So the, the article, the, the paper, the uh, report, how, however you say it, there's many con contributors, uh, Science Mag, uh, came out with it, and it's uh, the policy form, ecology and economics uh, for pandemic prevention, COVID-19 investments to prevent tropical um, deforestation to limit wildlife trade and predict against future zoonosis outbreaks. Now, um, that is a mouthful, and the paper is um, very complex, very thorough for the information at hand, for all the the data that you had to go through uh, available um, at the time, and you mentioned that in the paper. A after reading it several times, um, and, and I want you to give me the synopsis a lot better than I could, but really what I see, it's, a, a, it's showing economists and politicians that there is a preventative way that is much more cost effective than the reactionary way to do it. Let's wait for the next one and just react. If we put some monies in that we will be putting in anyway in preventative measures, the outcome is much better. The return and, and the ease of, of, of problems is much better. Um, now, I know I'm not a scientist, so I'm making it very easy and simple, but I'm sure you can tell us much more how it's about. Uh, yeah. Well, the first thing is often when scientific papers appear in journals, unless you subscribe to that journal, you can't read it. This, uh, this piece is in the public domain, so anybody can go to science and read it. Um, if they do, they'll find it's two and a half thousand words, and when you only have two and a half thousand words, you have to make sure that every single one of them counts. So there were times when, you know, I sat there and argued um, uh, every which way with my colleagues to save two words in a sentence. Um, however, there, is, there are a lot of good write-ups. And, and if I may plug my favorite newspaper, The Guardian, it's been my newspaper since I was 12 years old when it was called The Manchester Guardian. There's a really excellent piece in The Guardian and The Guardian does brilliant graphics so if anybody wants to have a, a, a much easier version, go, go to The Guardian and look it up. The message is that, yeah, there are some very, very practical things that we can do. Um, and they're cheap. Um, they're, they're, they're staggeringly cheap compared to, um, um, to, to what the nations of the world spend on military preparedness. And, and after all, this is a national security issue. This has hurt um, our nations as, as much as a small war might. Um, it's killed a huge number of people. We ought to be thinking of this in terms of its security implications for our societies. Um, but they are very straightforward. We should stop chopping down forests. Uh, we should suppress wildlife trade wherever possible. There are exceptions. Um, we ought to put much more money into prevention. Now, I don't want to in any way criticize the World Health Organization. It's an organization I greatly admire, and it does a superb job. Um, but it focuses on what its name suggests, which is, you know, the health piece of this. Uh, you know, you get sick and WHO, you know, starts thinking about what they can do about it. We need, to be, we need to be looking at the stages before that. We need to look at what, you know, bats and monkeys and rats and mice, what are they carrying? What's out there? What are the dangers? 
we need to be looking at the early stages when you get spillover from, from those species into domestic livestock or into humans. I mean, if we'd have been on the, you know, if we'd have been paying attention when, when HIV first spread into people in Western Central Africa, you know, we could have saved trillions of dollars and 10 million lives. We need to be out there at the beginning. We need to shape this agenda to be more, you know, environmental, ecologically oriented, and less on the, you know, taking care of the health issues um, after the fact. Um, and I think that simple message, e even if the paper is, is, is hard going, is, is one that's easy to, easy to get. I like it very much. And we'll definitely put a couple links in, into the show notes when we post and, and, and publish it so that people will know how to find it and also putting Saving Nature and uh, Duke uh, on there, Nicholas Duke on there as well. I, leading now, already almost an hour into it, I, I want to give you my first question and we'll move into some some questions that you might not be able to answer, but you might, might, might have uh, opinions on it as well. Uh, grew up in Britain, uh, wife's American. How do you feel about uh, being a global citizen or the term? And uh, what if uh, a future without walls, borders, nations, divisions of humanity, uh, which is really kind of how nature and other species work and operate, how food works and operates as, as we've seen through this pandemic. What are your thoughts and feelings on, on that? Um, I, I have to tell you that I was enormously disappointed when Britain left, left the European Union. Um, I was definitely a Remainer. I, I, I think it, it behooves us to, 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 to develop close and practical ties with our neighbors um, and um, I, I most certainly do not, you know, support Boris Johnson and his efforts to take Britain out of Europe. But that's actually not really particularly relevant to, to these issues. Um, the, the issues are that whatever national boundaries, this disease crossed those boundaries like that in a, you know, a second. Um, that it very, very quickly spread around the world. And so whether we, whether we recognize our national boundaries or not, um, we have to recognize that we do not live in an isolated world. Um, diseases spread, the, the carbon dioxide pollution that we, we create by burning fossil fuels in our cars, in our homes, by burning tropical forests, uh, those are consequences that have global significance. So whatever our views on, on national cooperation are, whatever our political views are, um, um, I, we, we have to address, you know, we have to address the, 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 the essential one, one world view that we have. I mean, earlier you talked about that, that iconic photograph of, of, the, of the earth rising from the moon. Yes, yes. I think that, um, inspired you know billions of people it said look we're this little lonely blue marble you know we we better we better get our act together yeah and that, that that's more i didn't really want to push any political at all um although as you as you mentioned with a uh, uh, brexit there are a lot of consequences not only with food and um other things that have a ripple effect on that globally but there are there are some nations w w with uh, where the, where they see themselves as as like an old, old their own national planet to some respects that are making decisions tropical forest burning or whatever the the, the cause is uh, the the big one right before the pandemic was um, one that that uh, Australia was burning right before the pandemic and it released 900 million metric tons of carbon dioxide which is uh, double that of what they emit in a single year for all of Australia, just through industry and that. And, you know, there's not a lot of conversation about that, but the, the bigger wave is obviously climate change, environmental destruction. And, and um, uh, you know, when I, when I ask the question of global citizenry, 
the air we breathe, the food we eat, the waters we drink, um, uh, and those don't have boundaries. They are global citizens. Pan the pandemic, it is a global citizen. And so if, if uh, some nations or some places are making decisions for us all and affecting us all, whether it's, uh, you know, with pollution or whatever, that that's kind of the reason I asked that question. And it's a, it's a little bit leading, but I want to, you answered it very I mean, eloquently. It's, it's a good question. I mean, yeah. uh, the, the U.S. has, um, uh, you know, contributes a huge amount to, 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 to global heating um, because of its emissions. Um, and and to some extent, it's coming back and biting us on the arse yeah. uh, because we're having these massive fires in, in the West, there are droughts in the Midwest. Um, Australia, which has uh, for, had politicians that have simply denied, you know, global heating is taking place, has now had some massive fires. One of the, you know, one of the important feedbacks, one of the things that Jim Lovelock has written about yes. um, is that as temperatures warm, uh, things become more flammable. Forests dry out, they become more flammable, they burn, they put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, uh, and, and that makes it even worse. Um, and, and so there are a lot of consequences, and those consequences are global. Um, you know, as we warm the planet, um, the Arctic is melting um, faster than ever before. And that's rising sea levels, that's causing damage along coastlines. Uh, North Carolina uh, uh, has a very, very low uh, flooded coastline and floodings, um, uh, floodings going to get a lot worse. I mean, you can't, you can't simply put a wall around your country. Yeah. Um, President Trump trying to build a wall on the Mexican border um, was, was farcical in all sorts of ways, not least yeah. of which they had a storm that blew pieces of it down. Um, but the reality is that we can't isolate ourselves from, um, from COVID, from global heating, from all these other things. We have to recognize that, you know, we have to, we, we have to, you know, not only play nicely with each other, we have to play smartly. We have to come to, to global agreements on, on climate change, on deforestation, on, on the spread of, spread of diseases. That leads me to nicely um, to the first burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word, I promise, it's what's the future? And, I, and you, you can answer it for you, you don't need to answer it for all of us. Well, what's, the, what's the future? Um, you know, when Al Gore in An Inconvenient Truth talks about species going extinct a thousand times faster than they should, He's quoting the work that I do, or did, well, still do. Yeah. Um, and so uh, the question I get from most journalists is, you know, you know, Professor Pym, how do you get up in the morning? Uh, you know, how do you get up in the morning where you're the go-to guy for telling us we're losing Earth's biodiversity? And the simple answer, I get up in the morning because there's so much I can do. I, uh, I'm very, very optimistic that we're smart enough to come up with solutions. Um, it's why I founded Saving Nature. It's why my group is, is very energetically um, helping wonderful local conservation groups around the world um, uh, plant native trees. Uh, it reforests the areas, it reconnects areas, helps with global heating. Um, my feeling is that there's a lot of smart things that we can do. We need to be doing more of it, and we need to do it with a greater sense of urgency. But what's the future? I think we can get through this. Um, I, I don't, um, you know, I, I, I don't go to bed crying in my beer. Um, um, I usually go to bed absolutely exhausted because I've worked a long day, and I get up ready to do, you know, new things. Um, you know, my day to day will be, you know, very much um, looking at how, uh, how I can support a reforestation project in Ecuador. We want to be able to help, uh, help people um, on, the, on the Eastern Andes. So, you know, we can do this. We can change our lives. We can make a lot of, of smart, smart decisions in, in, in the way we do things. We can 
consume energy, we can be, we can tread more gently on, on the landscape. A whole long list of, of personal decisions, decisions we can make as groups to, to engage with other, uh, others. I hope people will engage with saving nature. Um, we, can, we can hold our politicians' feet to the fire uh, and we can tell them that environmental issues matter. And so you're saying by those actions that uh, we can take now, actually we're creating that, that future, that resilient, desirable future we, we, that we all can enjoy and live in. And as this, this almost this symbiotic or more uh, conservation and protection one with nature. Uh, um, I, I really, I really like that. And, and um, I see that throughout all your work. And that's also what I read in the paper as well. There's so many people that can take actionable items into their own life. And it's specific for each individual and how and the way they apply it, but there are so many numerous things that can be done. It's, uh, it is doable, and, and I'm also very optimistic. Um, I, I don't know if you knew this, but I was one of the first 50 people trained by Al Gore in his ranch in Carson's Tennessee. I'm in both the movies Inconvenient Truth and the sequel as well, and used to be the Germany and Austria country manager. But uh, it's a really, really uh, great man, uh, he's done a lot of things to date. He's trained about 27,000 climate leaders and, you know, done the movies and written the books. There are some fabulous youth activists, youth leaders out there that are doing a lot of things. You might be aware of Felix Finkbeiner. He um, has a foundation called Plant for the Planet. He, uh, uh, he, he tells politicians, stop talking and start planning. He has planted uh, uh, well over 500 million trees to date. He's uh, sold a fair trade chocolate bar that uh, protects uh, far indigenous farmers, farmers, and for every chocolate bar that's sold, and it's usually at international conventions or conferences, there is one tree planted. And in that process, uh, not only has he planted a lot of trees, but he's also trained about 87,000 climate leaders to give his presentation and think about planting trees. And he's from, he's from Germany, he started when he was nine years old, spoke at the General Assembly with that movement. And now I think he's 22, 23, something like that. But uh, there are fabulous people not giving up, continuing to take action and, and follow, you know, the words and wisdom that you're doing and, and also setting great examples. It's, uh, I, mean, I, I, feel, I feel very lucky to be, uh, you know, to, to be a, a teacher. Uh, I have fantastic students at Duke. I have fantastic students in, in South Africa. But, you know, I, I engage students around the world um, and, and they're their enthusiasm and their, and their dedication, you know, is, is hugely encouraging. You realize that, you know, they can do this. The world is, um, their world is at risk. Um, I think we all understand that if we don't get this right in this century, it's going to be catastrophic. Um, and, and so, you know, there is a, an ever greater sense of urgency. But I think there's also a greater sense of, of understanding and competence. Um, when I started trying to look at what was happening to the planet 20 years ago, um, we, didn't have, uh, we didn't have Google Earth. Um, I got the opportunity to, um, uh, with a small group of colleagues, to ask the uh, administrator of NASA to make two uh, global coverages of Earth available because back in 20 years ago, that wasn't the case. And now we think nothing of, oh, uh, you can get a Google Earth, you can see where forests are happening, uh, where forests are recovering, where they're, where they're being destroyed. You know, we've got, our, we've, got our, we've got our intelligence. You know, a company now that's trying to cut a, uh, an illegal logging road into a protected area in the Ecuadorian Amazon you know, we see them and we can get that message, you know, sometimes on the front page of the New York Times, uh, you know, before the, uh, before the CEO has even woken up in the morning. I mean, there's a lot of, we, we have a much better grasp of what's going on and we can use that intelligence to, to, to affect um, appropriate actions.
I belong to a, a group with the United Nations. It's called the Digital Ecosystem for the Earth. It's a geospatial data sources, uh, uh, numerous, uh, uh, close to uh, 1,300 different sources that everything from Google Earth to NASA to uh, European Space Agency and many, many others, uh, Planet Home, things like that, that uh, provide these uh, important vital data. It is uh, real time, up to the date, accurate, yep. lifeblood pulse, heartbeat of our planet, so to say, precipitation data, soil moisture, et cetera, on and on. That is so vital to know for conservation, but also for agriculture and just how we can act and use that data for good to make sure that we restore, conserve, and heal our planet in a way. So I, I love that you all, that's also mentioned in the paper as well, but also in some of your other, other works uh, on how, how we can use the tools at hand, you know, to, to keep up to speed with our exponentially growing world and use that function in a positive way to, to react. Um, this, the second or last hardest question I have for you is kind of similar to the burning question, but a little bit different of a twist. Um, it's what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Um, I think um, we are going to have <coughs> to address some fundamental issues in, in, in how we are how we are abusing the earth. Um, I mean, a, a lot of people say, well, why don't you spend all your time talking about human population growth? There is no doubt that human population growth is, 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 is a major driver, um, but it's just one of two. Uh, the other is um, um, our ever insatiable demand for more stuff, uh, ever increasing aspirations to live uh, more expensive lives. Um, and so when we in developed nations, you know, tend to point fingers at poorer nations and say, you know, you're having too many children, it's right for them to point back and say that you're consuming more. Now, you know, I like to live well. Um, I'm not trying to tell you I live a poor life. I don't. But I do think that we have to think, you know, carefully about, about consuming a lot less. Be energy efficient, be increasingly developing renewable energies, supplies, um, not uh, constantly destroying the world's forests, not constantly destroying the world's fisheries. You know, one of the most obvious ways in which we encounter uh, our impact on the environment uh, is to look at what's on the fishmonger's slab. Uh, you know, I grew up in the north of England where haddock and chips was comfort food, cod and chips. You know, now you go to uh, the fishmongers. I did this morning. I did my shopping early on a Sunday morning. Um, you know, and and the most of the fish was tilapia, which is farm raised, and I hate tilapia. Um, you know, we need to be looking after our resources better, and that um, has to be part and parcel uh, of of as uh, rich people consuming less, but consuming smartly, and and, and recognizing that there can't be these extraordinary um, inequities in, uh, in inequalities um, in, in people's lives. You know, the, 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 the person who is, you know, eating bats uh, is, is trying to make a living um, and it's cost the world tens of trillions of dollars. The person who is smuggling pangolin scales um, I don't have a lot of sympathy for them, and we need to stop that. But, you know, in a way, it's a reflection of people's desperation. Um, you know, should, should we discourage people from, from killing rhinos for their horns? Yes. Uh, but at the same time, we, we need to be thinking of how, 
how we can use our resources to, uh, you know, to help people who are living in, in poor areas of Africa. These are all solvable problems. Um, and it's clear that we have to have a, a more even uh, society socially if we're going to affect the kinds of environmental changes that I've been talking about. Yes. So, I mean, part of it is really Einstein's problem theory. We can't uh, solve our problems with the same thinking that we used when we created them. We have to think, think about them a little bit differently, apply them different. What you just said, there's many rabbit holes that we could go down and, and dive deeper into, one being population and the, the, the divisions and thoughts behind that one. Uh, um, but more generally, it all really ties into uniquely what occurred yesterday. Yesterday was Earth Overshoot Day, August 22nd. Last year, it was July 29th was Earth Overshoot Day. Through this pause and this pandemic, we've gained 24 more days. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's nice to hear. It's nice to hear that a forced lockdown and, and pandemic, we can gain some days, but I, I think there's also some things that we're not realizing, the permafrost and the methane that's occurring, the, the, the like I mentioned, uh, Australia burning before that and how much more in emissions just through that, um, that, that it's not enough to rebalance and get us back into the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries. That whole principle of Earth Overshoot Day as we are consuming and using more resources than we have in the day, whether that, that thinking and that model evolved from, from one of the great books, the, the Limits to Growth from the Club of Rome and the Volkswagen Foundation yep. cool. uh, and uh, other fabulous pe people, you know, um, it's just uh, amazing that we, to, to have a replicable life, to live within the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries, Today, we, we would do that with 1.6 global hectares that is replicable. That means that if we had those resources and that, that, that global hectare, we could have enough food, drinking, uh, food, water, shelter, security, resources to live a ripe old good long age uh, uh, with good stewardship. But per person, and we, we've heard, I'm sure many of our listeners have heard this before, that if we all lived like Americans, we'd need five planets worth of resources like Germans or the French, three planets worth of resources and on and on. Um, we really can thrive and, and have that abundance that, that we all need and live a good life. If we do it, one, not only that sustainable, but we're, we're moving out of that uh, sustainable arena where we're beyond the limits to growth, uh, as the book mentions as well that we need to build in some resilience there. So it uh, doesn't matter how sustainable you are, a community or city is, if the very next day Hurricane Maria, Maria or Katrina or whatever comes along and wipes out all your infrastructure, food and resources, that takes time to grow back. And so we need to have some resilient systems and infrastructures in place, which does include sustainability within it to survive and, and, and it is a different global model. That kind of transitions or leads me into my second to last question for you. And that is, uh, you, you may know, I, I don't know if you do know, I'm an advocate for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And I, I would like to know your thoughts and feelings on them, but also as maybe as a global plan to get us to December 2030, keep us below 1.5 degrees of warming. Um, if, if those principles, those goals, targets, and indicators are probably something that really could help us in conservation and action and, and, and something to, to keep us within that planetary boundaries. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the, um, the, 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 uh, the development goals are, are, are very sensible and very prudent. And, and I think they do provide a, a roadmap, as the politicians like to say, um, for, for, for getting there. I, I, they are clearly a consensus uh, statement on the part of, um, uh, of a large number of people. Um, in my particular space, uh, we have the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, it has uh, aspirations for slowing the rates of 
of, of species extinction, of protecting more of the planet. Um, and, uh, you know, we can quibble about the fine details of those. Uh, but, you know, I think they're, they're, they're broadly very, very sensible. And they, 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 they are things to which we must, as a global society, we, we must move in those directions. We need to address those issues. Um, and the lesson from, you know, the lesson from COVID is that if, if we don't, it's going, to, it's going to harm an awful lot. Uh, more people than than if we uh, 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 if we ignore them. My last question for you is more of uh, a request for you to give my listeners a, a sustainable takeaway, something, a tool, a tip, a trick of empowerment that would help them to either be more conservationists or apply something in their life that uh, will leave them better for hearing the podcast, but also something that they could apply in their lives, maybe to create a better future for, for all involved. Yeah, just, you know, we hear so much about how much, uh, how much carbon dioxide we're putting in the atmosphere. Okay. Um, you know, a billion tons a year comes from burning tropical forests. And so I often ask people, how much do you think it would cost you uh, to become carbon neutral, to live a lifestyle where you soak up uh, more carbon than you put out? Um, and I can promise you that I spend more money on coffee than it takes to, to become carbon neutral. Uh, we, we can make you carbon neutral uh, for about $100 a year at Saving Nature. Um, somewhat less than that if you're in European countries than if you're an American. Um, and, and yes, I spend more than $100 on coffee every year. Um, and I think there are actions like that. Um, the fish that I eat, I make sure it's sustainable. There's a nice little app that comes from in a Monterey Bay Aquarium that tells you which fish, fish stocks are being harvested sustainably. Um, there are a lot of choices like that, day-to-day -day choices, simple um, and, and, yet, and yet effective. And then the final thing is, you know, when was the last time you talked to a politician? And the answer is, you know, if it's longer than a month ago, you know, shame. You know, we elect our public officials, let's make sure that they hear from us. Let's show that we meet with them when they are visiting their districts. Let's make sure they, they hear from us when, when they're in parliament or Congress or whatever the body is called. Um, uh, we need to hold their feet to the fire and, and make sure they're doing the right things towards, to, towards the environment. Thank you so much, Stuart. It's been a sheer pleasure. And I hope that we can have a discussion maybe next year again, or when you have your next updates that uh, you can catch us all up to speed. But it's been an absolute pleasure. We could speak for hours. I know that we have tons, tons to discuss. Um, thank you very much for your time. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on the program. Most welcome. Thank you.